This is the Monday, December 3rd, 2018 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes for a brand new episode every other Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. In this episode, our time machine turns Zamboni and hits the ice for a marketing experiment that slipped and fell flat on its face. It's the true tale of the greatest fan shot in hockey history. It's the moment when the New York Islanders, a decade removed from their four-in-a-row Stanley Cup dynasty of the early 1980s, chose a new mascot and logo that resembled nothing so much as a frozen food pitch man, the Gorton's Fisherman. And while people may have been encouraged to trust the Gorton's Fisherman, they certainly didn't want to cheer for his likeness on the ice. But this story is much more complicated than that. And it's a lot funnier. Joining us to do color commentary is our friend, Nicholas Hershon, who brings us We Want Fish Sticks the bizarre and infamous rebranding of the New York Islanders. We last heard from Nick when he invited me to conduct a live interview for the Joint Journalism and Communication History Conference at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Our guest that day was ephemeral New York's Esther Crane, who chatted with us about her book, The Gilded Age in New York, 1870 to 1910. When I met Nick that day, He had a New York Islanders tie on, and I had to ask him about it since that was the team I grew up rooting for. As soon as he told me that he based his dissertation on this infamous rebranding, and he was writing a book about it that was coming out later in the year, I said, we've got to nail that down. So this is an interview I've been looking forward to for a long time. As you may recall, Nick Hershon is an assistant professor of communications at William Patterson University and a former reporter for the New York Daily News. You've also seen his work in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Hockey News. His previous books are Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum, which is the arena where the Islanders built that dynasty. And by the way, Nick Hershon has some water from the ice of their final game there before they moved to Brooklyn. That tells you what kind of fan he is. He also wrote Forest Hills, about his Long Island hometown, with a forward by actor Ray Romano. You can visit our guest online at nickhershon.com, follow him at Nick Hershon on Twitter, Instagram, and toss him a like at facebook.com slash nhershon. If you're interested in meeting up with Nick, maybe talking about the team and getting a copy of We Want Fish Dick signed, I wanted to mention a few book events that he has that are occurring just after we upload this episode on December 3rd. He's doing a book talk and signing on Saturday, December 8th at 3 p.m. in the Queens Library. That's on Union Turnpike in Glen Oaks, Queens. He's doing a book signing on Saturday, December 29th at 6 p.m. That'll take place in the Offside Tavern at 137 West 14th Street between 6th and 7th Avenues in Manhattan. In fact, I may head down for that one especially since the signing event will continue throughout the televised coverage of the Islanders' away game against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Fans will recall that number 91 on the Leafs, John Tavares, left the island, abandoning his longtime team, for which he'd been the captain, for Canada's largest city. So that's a real grudge game, and I bet next time he comes back to Long Island, he's going to get booed every time he touches the puck. Nick Hershon will also be doing a book signing on Thursday, January 10th, 2019 at 4 p.m. That's at Jerry Cosby and Company, 11 Penn Plaza at 7th Avenue between 31st and 32nd Streets in Manhattan. 
dangerously close to the home arena, Madison Square Garden, of the Islanders' rival, the New York Rangers. Nick will be at the East Hampton Library on Saturday, January 26th, 2019, at 1 p.m. That's 159 Main Street in East Hampton, Long Island. Okay, now that we've finished the pregame skate, let's strap on the pads, pull on that NHL sweater with the Fisherman logo on the front, and step onto the ice to mocking chants of We Want Fish Sticks. I'm at William Patterson University with Nicholas Hershon, author of We Want Fish Sticks, the bizarre and infamous rebranding of the New York Islanders. Thank you so much for welcoming me here into your office and making the time to talk with me about this really fun, really interesting book. Thanks a lot for having me, Dean. You are wearing your fisherman hoodie, I can I tell am. people, since it's, <laughs> <laughs> since it's radio. And there was a time when many Islanders fans wishes that the team was just playing on radio. I think it was WOR in the old days. They would, Because you wouldn't have to look at those jerseys. The vitriol that people had for them in that season was really something else. And there are so many great memories. This book has no filler. You pick up We Want Fish Sticks, and it's all fish, no breading. You know, when you have <laughs> real fish sticks, sometimes they're good, they're bad, they're dry. It needs more tartar sauce, more tartar sauce. This book, you, you've you edited out all the breading, and you've given us a book where you can literally open it to any page, and I could ask you something about it, and we could have a really good laugh because it's a story of Endless struggle, endless failure, endless trying. It's a real underdog story for the New York Islanders in those years. And I enjoyed it. I've been dying to talk about it. And it's a book where I didn't really know where to begin. So I wanted to come and ask you about it and have you tell me, how did you embrace this? Because you weren't even an Islander fan at the time of infamy. That's right. I grew up in Queens and I became an Islanders fan because my grandparents lived in North America on Long Island. And every day we would uh, go to visit them, we would pass by Nassau Coliseum, where the Islanders used to play. And I became interested really in the 1999 season when the Islanders were in last place. But they were no longer wearing the Fisherman jersey, at least. A lot of fans were still coming to the games wearing those jerseys. So I got my first taste of it in the Nassau Coliseum stands, just wondering what was that jersey all about? I've never seen the team wear it on the ice. As any curious person might be, and certainly as I became a journalist and then a mass comm researcher in my time as a PhD candidate at Ohio University, I want to go a little bit deeper, learn a little bit more about the story behind this jersey, what brought it about, why did it engender so much hatred, and what lessons can we learn from it about the sports branding industry, about sports and about Long Island and all of these different things that interest me. So uh, that's how I kind of came to the topic. In addition to your jersey, listeners can't hear your eyes just get big, like with, with wonder when you speak about it. Like I asked about this jersey, I hadn't seen him play in it, you know. And I could just picture you as a young person. You're looking at it, and you automatically were dispelled from asking about it. It was just sort of an unspoken shame. There are people who have somebody in the family, right? I know that my dad has a brother, but we never talked about him or <laughs> what have you. He was a secret uncle when we were growing <laughs> up, and it was a, a dark period, and it really snowballs and that was something where you read it and you you just wait for somebody to to put the brakes on a little bit and to say stop because the hindsight is always 2020 and when you're talking about a sports book like we want fish sticks it's harmless fun it's something that you embrace that you you could say this is fun nobody's dying certainly some people were losing money they were worried about for instance you said about the jerseys a fan wearing them would have invested the money in it and also stores invested in that inventory. So it wasn't so easy just to turn that around. But other than things like that, people who grew up rooting for the Islanders, like myself, were wondering what this was. It was really pushing us away. I always tell people that I have two older brothers and we really mirror the teams and what our favorite teams are here in the New York metro area. My oldest brother, Jim, roots for the New York Rangers. They were the only game growing up when he was a kid. He's 10 years older than me, so he's almost 60 now. My brother Nick grew up during the Islanders' dynasty years, and since he was a little closer to my age, just seven years older, we started rooting for the Islanders together. 
And so we were really in the thick of this year and the, and the decline, unfortunately, of the team after that great Stanley Cup dynasty and the drive for five and win one for the thumb, trying to win that fifth Stanley Cup in a row. The New York Islanders, by the way, were the last team to win four Stanley Cups in a row. So this was a true, real dynasty. And one of the things I grew up loving about hockey was a small market team like the Islanders could make it. So here I have an oldest brother who's a Rangers fan. Then my middle brother was an Islander fan. And I realized as I was reading We Want Fish Sticks that I was one of the people that this book is about, where I start to look at myself when they change from this iconic jersey that you saw men holding that Stanley Cup over their head, bearded men. We have that tradition back then, growing those playoff beards, tough guys, fun guys. You're looking up to them as idols when you're a kid. Mike Bossy, this huge scorer, right machine, Dennis Potvin, it is brothering Chico Resch, some of these names, people even today, young fans, I'm sure some of your students still remember. I felt that they were pushing us away. And my brother Nick and I are saying, well, we were driving all the way out to Long Island. He was a season ticket holder. And so I'm looking at myself and saying, well, I went to the State University of New Jersey. I was born and raised in New Jersey. And the Devils, the New Jersey Devils, are starting to have some great seasons. They win the Stanley Cup. And so I, I went through that period I think many sports fans are familiar with where you say, well, unless they're playing each other, I'm not really torn for loyalty. But for me, it was very easy to make the switch because they were wearing a different logo. So I didn't feel like I was rooting against my childhood team at all. And you ask yourself, as you're reading We Want Fish Sticks, why? That's the word that it keeps coming down to. People asked at the time, why? Why, in the name of all the hockey gods hold holy, did they do this to us? And that's what I really want to explore in this story is... We have to give context to what happened. We take a first glance at that jersey and think, this looks absurd. Where did this come from? Did they just make it with crayons one morning as the <laughs> uh, executive working for the team on this rebranding joked at one point with me in one of our interviews? And obviously, there was a larger sports branding marketplace that was going on at this time. And what was happening to the Islanders specifically is, as you say, they were a small market team. They always were. Even though they are in the New York media market, they are not getting the media attention of the New York Rangers and Original 16. They're not playing at Madison Square Garden. Although they're pulling from what you would think would be a very affluent fan base on Long Island, at this period in the 90s, the Islanders have already won the four straight Stanley Cups only a few years after their inception in 1972. So fans maybe get a little bit spoiled. And then when the team isn't winning a Stanley Cup every year, it's easy to get disenchanted and start moving away from them. So by 1995, there were a few things that were going on. First off, the Islanders had gone from winning those four cups in the early 80s to losing to the Rangers in this dramatic playoff series in oh. 1994 <laughs> uh, that Islanders fans don't like to talk about. But Stan Fischler, one of the Islanders broadcasters, was telling me they called it the tennis series because the scores of the games were more like tennis scores, 6-0, 6-0. <laughs> they lose that series being outscored 22-3. And they're swept by their main geographic rival. So it's the greatest indignation that the Islanders could ever get. And in the aftermath of that series, of course, the Rangers go on to win the Stanley Cup for the first time since 1940. They break their curse. They're the toast of the town. Now the Islanders are left thinking, how do we rebrand ourselves? And the owners of the team, not really maybe associating with the fans as much as they should, being a little bit out of touch... They think the way to do this is to rebrand ourselves. People are starting to associate the traditional Islanders logo with the NY and the Long Island map with the futility of our recent disappointing seasons. They're no longer remembering Mike Bossy and Billy Smith and Brian Trottier and all the rest. Uh, and then they have to face this question of how do we rebrand? What is a good image to rebrand around? And all of this that kind of goes wrong. But there was a context there of them being small market, figuring out we need to get money some way rebranding, you know you're going to sell a lot of jerseys. And the Fisherman logo, even though it was a cultural disgrace and a lot of the fans hated it, the Islanders did actually go up in jersey sales by unveiling this new jersey. Even if fans said they hated it, <laughs> they bought it. So there were a lot of things that were going on at that time that kind of explain, maybe not it's a good excuse, but at least give some explanation of why they decided to go with this new jersey. Wasn't a bad idea on the face of it. I think it's as if you look at something sometimes and you say chocolate and peanut butter. Okay, those go great together. But sometimes you mix things together and by all rights, they should work. I remember looking at that jersey and saying, okay, the fisherman, that makes sense with the identity of Long Island. 
the water is everywhere when you're on an island, right? So it seemed like that should work, especially when you had new teams coming in. You had the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim at the time, San Jose Sharks, very cool logo, biting that hockey stick in half there for the, for the Sharks. So the Islanders say, well, look at some of these sales. Look at the LA Kings. They went from first to last when they changed their jersey. Of course, it helped that the first player people saw wearing that jersey was a guy named Wayne Gretzky. So, of course, everybody wanted to wear Gretzky, and he was coming to America. That was a big deal. I remember one sports writer describing at the time that in Canada, they felt like the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan had just just seceded from Canada and joined the U.S. because here he was leaving Canada, leaving the Oilers to go play and be near his wife's work, to be in L.A. for the Kings. So, no kidding, they sold those jerseys, a lot of them. And also the losing didn't help, right? And you talk about that here, and we want fish sticks, that if they had been able to put together a winning streak, if they hadn't had so much other chaos, people wouldn't have looked at that jersey as anything but winning. As you said, one player said, we don't care if you if you wear pink, which they do now. They sell the pink jersey, right? It just shows <laughs> true. you it's true. You wouldn't have cared if there was some winning behind it, but it became a convenient target and a really negative association for people. I think that that logo didn't have much of a chance to begin with when it was unveiled because it was such a departure from the Islanders tradition, everything that is associated with those Stanley Cups. But yes, if the team had started to win, you might grumble about the logo, but say, well, but you know, they're winning, so I can't really complain about it. But as I describe in the book, there's the Rangers fans chanting, we want fish sticks, which inspired the title of the book, which is mocking the logo for its similarity to the Gorton's Fisherman logo. Yeah. Uh, there's the hiring of Mike Milbury as their coach and eventually their yeah. general manager. And he turns out to have some really zany tactics and not mesh well with that roster at all, not help develop the young players that they had. So then their players get disillusioned. They trade for Kirk Muller, who is the captain of yeah. the Stanley Cup champion Montreal Canadiens. They think they're getting a guy who has played in the New York market before because he played with the Devils. He's somebody who's a point-of-game player, wears his heart on his sleeve, and then he refuses to report to the team. He shows up every night, except that he doesn't show up at all. Exactly. It's kind of infuriating at the time that <laughs> yeah. they trade for him. And he says, you know, the one thing you're going to get from me is I show up every night. And then the first few games, he doesn't show up on Long Island. Yeah. I and mean, they have to make all these excuses for him. So there's a series of things that are happening around the team that makes it excessively hard to have a good association with this logo. And if they got a few more breaks along the way, maybe made a few different decisions about who they hired as the coach or some of the players they decided to trade or draft, then we could be talking about a much different story. I probably wouldn't have had a book to write because it would have been <laughs> yeah. a pretty fun story about them winning cups and maybe uh, people don't get as much enjoyment out of this. I thought this was fun because of everything that went wrong, almost impossibly wrong. It really is that. You're reading it and saying to yourself, oh my, and not possible. <laughs> How could this be? How could everything? I mentioned that it's sort of like the Three Stooges where there's just this comedy of errors. That's why we have that phrase, and that's what this is. I mean, they could call it a fish sticks now because of this. Everything comes together, and hockey fans are so inventive and also so superstitious where you say, well, that logo, the logo is why. It's a break from the past, but the past is already feeling long ago. Yeah, after that year that the Rangers win, then the Devils win the Stanley Cup in 95, and there's a lockout in that season. So you're feeling as if it's really pushing you away. It's been so long since you've been able to see them win wearing anything that, like with myself, you stop feeling like they're your team. You start to feel like, well, they don't they don't want me, so let's just uh, I'm just going to go and, and go away and go somewhere where they give me something that I want. And that was that feeling, and it's just really unfortunate timing. And you talk about the chant that led to the title of the book, We Want Fish Dicks, all the more insulting because for the past decades, Islanders fans had been able to taunt the Rangers with that 1940 chant. You know, myself included, you'd go to those games and it would just raise the rafters and just broke their hearts always. And then that was taken away from them in that series. As an aside, you don't mind if I have another aside, do you? Of course not. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, all about a time machine. I really feel like traveling into the past with this one. But I remember in that 94 playoff series, we were watching them play the Rangers. But back then, you couldn't get the games on any channel you wanted, especially Islanders game. Another sign of what you talk about in We Want Fish Dicks, about them being a third or even fourth team in the area, unless they were doing really well. And even then, because there's already deals. Everyone is already locked up by the Rangers. And so we had to go to my brother Nick's wife's 
beauty shop where she cut hair. She had a shop and she happened to have sports channel there. So we had to go there and sit among all, you know, those hair dryers and stuff. And you're just sitting there. And so already it's like, it's a weird forum to be watching sports, but that's how dedicated we were to while watching this series. And of course they just get destroyed. They had Ron Hextall and goal. And I remember I read it actually in your book. So it reminded me of when it was, but it was about, I thought it was the first two games, but anyway, he's giving up a goal on the first shot in two games and Stan Fistler, you mentioned there, the Maven. I remember him saying in the color commentary, well, the key is for this game is just for Hextall not to give up a goal in that first shot. He has to do that. And my brother Nick turned to me and he said, how absurd is it that that's even an issue? Right. But, but at least for us, we had a brother. We could look to Jim. We knew he'd been a long-suffering Rangers fan. And we looked at those players that were that were great players. And you could you could feel somewhat like, okay, it's all right. But then you have all this happening that you lose and other fans who don't have that connection aren't po- able to find anything positive. I was shocked you said fans even compare it to a swastika. I mean, that's the level of revulsion that you're talking about. So visceral. And I would even venture to say that 20 years ago or so, that was an era when people didn't constantly invoke the Nazis about everything, right? So it was, it was really a feeling for somebody at the time to have said that. I laugh, though, now, today, in every page of We Want Fish Dicks, and I wanted to know, now that it is behind you, you're starting to do some media here, hopefully people are picking this up to stuff stockings and give as Hanukkah gifts this year to fans that are any kind of sports fan, doesn't have to be an Islander fan or a sports fan of any of the area teams, it's just a great sports and marketing story, a fun and unique book. Are you hearing that from fans who have softened over time? I mean, you're wearing that. You you don't get it pulled over your head, the jersey, right? And Haven't yet. Well on. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I was tempted to. But our fans <laughs> just had to have it. But are fans liking it? Are they liking the book? What, what are they saying? Are they able to – a little cathartic here. Sports is, is close to the hearts of people of Long Island. I think fans are falling into a few different camps. So you have fans maybe like yourself who remember the Islanders winning in the early 1980s. And whenever they see this logo, hear the phrase, we want fish sticks, they immediately cringe. They ask, why are you dredging up all of these bad memories? They go back to Mike Milbury, Kirk Muller, and John Spano, who was the con artist who bought the team. So I think there's a lot of those fans who associate it with a lot of the negativity that was surrounding the team in 1995, 1996, 1997. And then you have a different camp of Islanders fans, more recent fans like myself, who fell in love with the team after the Fisherman logo was gone, and now have only known one logo to identify the team. And while we may love that logo, lots of other franchises have two or three other jerseys that they wear on the regular. We don't have that. And we see this and we just think this is a chance to be retro. A lot of us grew up in the 90s. It has a 90s sort of look to it. As you say, it evokes the kind of Mighty Ducks look or the San Jose Sharks look that was so popular. And for some people, if you grew up in the 1990s, then you still have a positive association with the players who were on the team at that time, even if they didn't win. So there were still people talking about Wendell Clark or Darius Kasparaitis or certainly Ziggy Palfi, who was the star on that team and went on to some great success with the LA Kings and elsewhere. So I still sense a little bit of that wariness about this book. Why would you dredge up something that's so terrible? And yet we are so far past it. No one who worked on the team then is still there now. None of the players obviously are around. The ownership has changed. So I think it's time that we take a historical look at it and we can all move on and just admit that it was, uh, you know, an embarrassing period, but there were some fun times and it's worth kind of giving the context to it. And they did ultimately stay in Long Island. When I came here to meet you at William Patterson University, I wore my retro, speaking of retro, I wore my Quebec Nordiques hat because here's a small market team that didn't make it. They ended up going to Colorado and becoming the Avalanche and to add insult to injury, winning the Stanley Cup the year that they move, which was something. And so it was just a real effort here to say, look, we want to stay in Long Island. And then the, the fans kind of turn on them and it's just out of frustration. And it's a real comedy of errors in the sense that it is funny looking back. And I hope people that were fans will be able to look back at it and say, hey, they were trying. It would have been easy to sell to somebody else. You mentioned that they have this 
ownership problem. And so they're just trying to get the money in. You know, it is a business. And they were trying like heck to keep them on Long Island when the Hartford Whalers, another team, leave from Hartford, Connecticut and go down. And they also win the Stanley Cup then a few seasons later in the Carolinas as the Carolina Hurricanes. So they really wanted to keep them there. And it's a thing I've always loved about hockey is it is that small market team. It is a sport where not everybody loves it. People don't understand icing. Before I married my wife, who's from Canada, I would go to a game and my neck would hurt. So I would have to change seats between periods because I would be constantly turning and explaining it to people that were watching the game with me because they wouldn't understand what was going on. And I always liked that. I like that For instance, if a hockey player sends a tweet that somebody wants to be offended by, it's not front page news, honestly. These guys are able to fly underneath the radar, and you're able to really be into it for the sake of the sport. And I like that. And I think if you have to have a mistake every now and then where your team chucks an old mascot and they're really trying to keep the team there, then we should be able to embrace that. It's not real life. It's sports. It's supposed to be an escape from real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what was happening here, as you say, the Islanders really had no reason to be on Long Island anymore by the mid-1990s. You have the post-lockout NHL where it's becoming increasingly difficult for small market teams to hang on to their elite players in an era of free agency. They really don't have much to offer because Nassau Coliseum, their arena, is leaking. It's not being maintained by Nassau County. They're not deriving the majority of the revenue from that building, from parking, from concessions, and so forth. They are losing some of the loyal fans they had because they've been losing for so long. Uh, And the only way they can try to stay relevant to fight for some attention in a crowded sports marketplace because they're in the New York market. So you're competing with not only the Rangers and the Devils, but in a larger sense with all the other sports teams here. And you have monoliths like the Yankees and the Knicks. But then you just have movie theaters and shopping malls and opera and Broadway and everything else that pulls our attention away from the Islanders. So... I think this was a genuine attempt to try to connect with the Long Island fan base by using an image of a fisherman, and they thought that would be a provincial image that maybe Long Islanders would say, this is our team, this is what distinguishes us from the big city New York Rangers, we have this seafaring culture, and just in a larger way to try to struggle to keep this team where it belonged, where it had won all the Stanley Cups. And it still just seems amazing that they were able to do that. And that's where then there was this miscommunication between ownership and the fan base, because the fan base views it as you're departing from tradition. Why are you getting rid of this logo we love so much? And the ownership is like, you guys don't know how difficult it is just to keep the team where we are right now. This team could be, you know, for a long time, they're talking about the Islanders moving to Kansas City or Quebec or anywhere else. That's part of this story too. It was people who really had the best intentions at heart for the most part, at least in the ownership before John Spano, the con artist, bought the team. Tried to do the right thing, even if it didn't work out in the end. It was a story of so much hope that just wasn't communicated. People felt the exact opposite. The fans felt the exact opposite of what was really happening on the team, on the ownership side. They didn't know that they cared, I think, is is part of the thing. They didn't talk to those old players. They didn't talk to the fans. They didn't ask them to try to do market research. We take all that for granted now. Even if we're not in marketing, everybody's a marketer. I know Peggy Noonan, the speechwriter, she says that when you see people today do man on the street questions, MOSs, they all know how to package a soundbite. We just picked that up from all these years of watching TV. It's not like in the in the early days of television where people didn't really know what to say. Go back and look at a Dwight D. Eisenhower speech when he was president. They say some people love the the camera loves them. Well, the big smile, the camera may have, but the video did not love Ike. Ike was so stilted, and he just wasn't able to deliver it. He hadn't grown up with TV. Kids today, they grow up with every time that they do something being on video. And so we've learned that over time. Speaking of kids at the time, I wanted to invoke one story, the mascot here that graces the cover of We Want Fish Sticks. There's a quote in this book, and I will confess that not stealing any money from you, but I had to text this to tease the book to a bunch of people I knew. It's a quote by a 10-year-old boy. He says of this red-bearded mascot, quote, I'd like to assassinate him. I think he's stupid. I think he looks horrible. 
and the Rangers are going to win, unquote. <laughs> and again, fortunately, this was before the days, uh, and in a more innocent time in the mid-90s where uh, saying you were going to assassinate a mascot didn't cause an immediate lockdown of the team and right. getting this kid out of school and sending him somewhere. But he just had picked that up, I guess, somewhere, the visceral anger against poor Niles here, N-Y-I-S-L-E-S, is the fan. That was a great thing. They tried to do that. They did the same thing with the Devils, how to name the team. That was getting the fans involved there. What name should we give this guy? You spoke so much to the man that's inside that suit, Rob DiFiori. He really suffered. It's too bad. I felt bad for him. I was telling people yesterday at a dinner that I was at that this is his dream job, and they bring him in there. He finally gets a chance. He tries out to be the Philly fanatic, for instance, and he just wants to be a mascot. And unfortunately, this is the moment that he has to step into those skates. And it's tough. A, a fan sucker punches him. There's a there's a kid that comes up to him every game and, and taunts him in a way that I'll let you read. We want fish sticks to discover, but it is quite painful. <laughs> the team ultimately tells him, stay in the locker room for the third period if the Islanders are behind, which was pretty much every game, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, <period>. yes. <laughs> I mean, that's not too good. You're hired to be the mascot, and they tell you stay inside. So it's a dream job for Rob DiFiori that – turns to a nightmare and the guy has some tough personal problems they, they won't even give him free tickets they tell him well if you want free tickets you have to go pick up the organ player and he's a, a legend in his own right in fact it was at the Nassau Coliseum they had a trivia question once who was it that played for the Islanders and the Yankees and the Knicks and the Mets and he played the organ so this this was this gentleman he's used to a town car from the Yankees this is a great moment of the disconnect between the two franchises he's used to getting a chauffeured limo to bring him to the games and now the Islanders are having a guy that's you know <laughs> the big plastic head in the backseat, pick him up, before they'll give him free tickets for an empty arena, mind you. I mean, the arena's empty. You would think that giving tickets would have been an easy get, but it's not here for Rob DiFiori. Tell us a little bit about those conversations with him. How is he able to look back on that period of his life? Yeah, Rob DiFiori is a really interesting gentleman. So I found out about him because I was reading, I believe it was an old New York Times story about when the Islanders first unveiled their mascot, Niles which they did in the 1995 shortened season. You know, they mentioned Rob DiFiori is trying to have all these antics go through the stands at Nassau Coliseum. He doesn't know how to ice skate, so he can't go onto the ice. Uh, yeah. At least he does not ice skate very well. But he is an antic sort of guy. And I could tell that even decades later, interviewing him over the phone about this, he's someone who certainly has a lot of enthusiasm, and that's good for a mascot. But he also has some personal demons. Before he tries out to become the Islanders mascot, he had worked for Barney's, the high-end fashion store in Manhattan, and he felt that he didn't fit in, and he ends up resorting to drinking and drugs to compensate. He's addicted to cocaine at one point. He has alcoholism. He becomes very depressed. And although he says that by the time he becomes the Islanders mascot, he's eight years removed from his addictions, so he's clean, it can't be good for the psyche to be wearing this very heavy, awkward mascot costume. And one of the problems with this costume was that the head that Niles wore was apparently so heavy. And it had this big goal light on the top of his helmet that was supposed to flash whenever the Islanders score a goal. And it was just so heavy that it limited his ability to walk through the stands, quickly move around, connect with fans, be hyper the way that mascot should be. And then the reaction, as you're describing, that he's getting from the fan base, because they view him as the living embodiment of everything that's wrong about this rebrand. We don't want a new mascot. We just want the team to return to its Stanley Cup glory. Don't sell us some guy in a red beard who, for whatever reason, now represents the Islanders. Bring back the dynasty players. That's what we want. Bring back all the winning ways. So for a guy who's already going through a lot, I think that having to deal with that resistance from the fans even resistance at times from the team that's employing him, just not treating him very well. At the end of his time with the Islanders, when he gets let go, he has to take them to small claims court because they didn't pay him the full amount that he's owed for working all these games Gosh. and other events. So there was a lot that, unfortunately, he had to go through as part of it that is one of the sad parts of the story is that there are people's lives tied up in them. And so although I do think it's a, a fun story and it's comical at times, as you say, there's a man inside that costume, and it's sort of a, the tears of a clown of Rob DeFiori, where someone who really wanted to bring out joy in Islanders fans uh, really had a lot of respect in being their mascot and sometimes didn't get the sort of reaction that he should have deserved. 
it was a good moment that I think we're used to with players in major sports where we say we, we see Bull Durham, we see any of these sports stories where we know they suffer and they struggle and they overcome it. And I was glad to see that you gave him a moment or gave him several moments there where you tell that human story because there's something about mascots where if you're in a suit, people will punch you and, and kick you and do whatever to you and treat you crappy because they think, hey, that's your job. You know, you're know, you there for me to abuse you. And fans, hey, if there's not a lot of scoring going on, you're going to drink a little more. I took my father-in-law. The Winnipeg Jets were playing in Long Island. I love to go out to the old Coliseum and I said, see the breathalyzers in the hallway. I said, that that tells you something about the, the fans from the old days. I said, you know, they didn't want them getting in their cars and driving because everyone drove. There wasn't mass transit to go out there. This is before they moved to Brooklyn. So that was one of the things about it where you bring in those personal moments and you say, let's, let's remember that there were people that were trying and they were struggling. And when we invest in sports and we look at people and look at teams like this, we forget that those are stories that – we can relate to on some level. We can maybe have a little sympathy for people that were trying hard. Somebody who isn't as sympathetic or doesn't come across with much sympathy, you mentioned the owner, the Charlton owner there. Again, a story of hopes dashed, hopes dashed, hopes raised dashed, raised dashed so many times. Mike Milbury is another one of those, along with Kirk Muller not wanting to actually show up and play and then adding insult to injury by saying, I show up to play every night. That's my strength as a player. That's kind of hard when you don't actually come out of the locker room or go into the locker room or put the skates on. But anyway, Mike Milbury, somebody familiar to young hockey fans for TV commentary today, also to their parents for his coaching days, and maybe even their grandparents for his 12 seasons as a Boston Bruins defenseman, describe how he fits into this and how he also adds to some of that resentment for the jersey because of the antics that they hope will get them what you have here. You have the the front page, the back page here, the sports page, the New York market. For all the teams, that is the goal. That is scoring a hat trick. If you can be on the back page, get a full page. And they thought Milbury was bringing that, and he doesn't. And he, in fact, if he, it does show up there, it's because of bad things. So talk a little bit about his tenure in We Want Fish Sticks. I view the rebranding of the Islanders, as I call it, the worst sports branding failure of all time, as three seasons. The first season in that shortened 1995 season is the unveiling of Niles as the mascot that we just talked about. And trying to get the temperature of the fan base, would they welcome a new jersey and everything else. Then in the summer of 1995, the Islanders unveil the Fisherman jersey officially. But right around the same time, I think it's only a week or so later, Fourth of July, they unveil Mike Milbury as their new head coach. So Mike Milbury had been a hockey player with the Boston Bruins in the 70s and 80s. He's probably best known, infamously known, for being part of the Boston Bruins team that was playing at Madison Square Garden. And as the fans start to throw some things onto the ice and taunt some of the players, the Boston Bruins players actually ascend up the glass that separates the fans from the ice surface and go into the stands and fight the fans. <laughs> and Milbury famously takes off one of the fans' shoes and beats him with his own shoe in the stands <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. You shouldn't laugh yet. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Old-time hockey, as they say in Slapshot, right? Paul Newman. This is real life at the time. Another thing to love about hockey compared to other sports, not to interrupt you on it, but is that small market feeling. If people think something's lost in sports, if you're a little disillusioned on the NFL the past few seasons, or you, know, you don't think baseball players are really tuned into you because you see the salaries now, I say pick up We Want Fish Sticks because you get that feeling, whatever your age is, that you're, you're in a more innocent time. Really, it sounds crazy to talk about it. It's only the mid-90s, but those moments like that, you will not see a pro athlete today climbing up into the stands and beating somebody with anything, much less his own shoes. I know Ty Cobb went and had to fight a guy up there. We talked about that in A Terrible Beauty with Charles Learson about how he has this bad reputation, but that was similar to hear what poor Niles goes through where this guy was following him town to town and, and heckling him. So, you know, he finally has to go into the stands. So that, that's really that kind of thing. So I just wanted to mention as you're, you're on that roll there, which I didn't mean to trip you up as you're coming up ice on a breakaway, but the thing is that that's really what this book gets. L listen to it. And whoever you are, you'll be able to get something out of it for that small market feel. Yeah. So with Mike Milbury, that's his background as a player. So he's known for being very gritty and maybe having some unorthodox views about how to 
present yourself as a hockey player. And then he goes on to become a coach and he leads the Bruins to the 1990 Cup Final. So he has some success there. And at the time that the Islanders are interested in interviewing him to be their next coach, he is an analyst for ESPN. So he has a very high profile. And that's something that the Islanders lack. We've talked about how they don't get the media attention that the Rangers or even the Devils are getting. So one way to maybe get around that is hire somebody who's known for being flamboyant in certain ways, unconventional, certainly. They hire Milbury. He becomes one of the best paid coaches in hockey in the summer of 1995. I believe it's a five-year contract for about $3.5 million. They're willing to spend some money there to get who most people were actually encouraging them to pick as the best coach on the market. But when he comes to the Islanders, you very quickly start to see everything unraveling. When he, Milbury had been coaching the Bruins, they had a team with Cam Neely and Ray Bork, some of the best players in NHL history. The Islanders don't have that kind of a roster. Milbury is expecting certain things out of his players that they just can't produce. He's expecting some of these European players, for example, who are known more for their finesse, to be gritty players like he was and to get into fights. That's one of the disconnects that he has with Ziggy Palfi, who's the best player on the team, but Milbury gets upset at him at one point for not dropping the gloves and standing up for one of his teammates as he's getting beaten up in what I believe is a preseason game. So, <laughs> you know, Milbury is the first stage of that that summer rebrand where they're you know, starting to build up people who could be the face of the franchise, the face of the Fisherman logo. So you have Niles, then you have the jersey, then you have Milbury, and those would be some pretty ill-fated choices. <laughs> It was really a different era that he came up in, too, because today, or even then, really, he's at the tail end of that. He's a real dinosaur. He's trying to cook a meal here with ingredients that he doesn't have anymore. You don't want your top scorer in this era to go out and fight. You don't want him breaking a hand because he throws a punch for somebody. You have enforcers that do that. You have goons, as they call them negatively. You mentioned the term gritty, which is a great hockey term that can mean anything from a guy that stands up for his teammates and very gentlemanly will ask another player, hey, you want to go after this faceoff, to somebody who breaks an ankle in a game against the Soviets, right? So gritty can mean whatever you want. If it's if it's your player on your team, he's a gritty player. But sometimes if you look from the outside, you say, oh, that guy's dirty. So that was one of those things that you really get from this, that he doesn't fit. It's another piece of this puzzle they're trying to put together with Mike Milbury that the guy doesn't fit. And you have so much great stuff about him in there that any fan of any sports or anybody who wonders about sports will just say, wow, this was really an era in sports that this happened because you can't really believe it. And he was just such a poor fit, especially for those young players, especially as the NHL is changing. You know, we get this influx of Russian born and European born players when the Iron Curtain comes down. That's one of the one of the benefits of that happening, or if you can call it that, where you have guys that come in and they're able to play. Well, they're playing a different game. They're not punching. There's one game where the, the Red Army team refuses to come out of the locker room when they play an exhibition game against the Flyers because the Flyers are throwing them all over the place. So he really is another piece. It just doesn't fit, but you have a contract, so they have to pay him. Yeah, I mean, he immediately when he becomes the Islanders coach, he makes some headlines by saying at one point, F the Rangers at a press conference. Um, so this is <laughs> in the newspapers the next days. And of course, Islanders fans appreciate stuff like that, even though it is very colorful and not what you expect from an NHL head coach. But he also talks at his opening press conference about how the Islanders had their hands tied in previous years because they stuck onto the dynasty era players for so long long after they had kind of outlived their usefulness because they were good players in the early 80s. But if you keep them into the mid 80s and the late 80s, then obviously they're out of their primes. But making those sorts of comments, even if there was maybe some truth to them, is not going to endear yourself to a fan base that still holds those guys dear and to the players themselves from the dynasty teams who could have become ambassadors for this new brand. They could have been out there in the newspapers on TV saying, fans, give this a shot. We know that you still love the old logo. We do too. But we also know that times change, logos have to change. And maybe if you have a Mike Bossy or a Billy Smith or a Brian Trottier out there saying, give this a chance, maybe the fans respond. But when Milbury comes out there and emphasizes this break with Islanders Pass, as the New York Times puts it in a headline, it's just another way of disassociating yourself with one of the only positive things that that franchise had going for it. 
especially when he's not a player from a faraway team. I mean, he's right there in Boston, so he already has to prove himself to them, and he doesn't do that by disrespecting those players that are from the dynasty era because you want to believe that those guys can go on the ice right now and still score. You, you don't want to hear. You don't want to see them insulted. They mean so much to you, and I think if they had done that, it would have been a great opportunity. It, would have, it could have been done so well, but you also, because you have this multi-headed leadership structure for the Islanders that you describe in We Want Fish Dicks, there is no one person that's calling it. And it's impossible to run a team with a committee like that. That's part of what was going on, too. The Islanders in this era are still owned by John Pickett, who was their owner when they won the Stanley Cups. But since that period, he has moved to Florida and he ceded day-to-day control of the team to what's known as the Gang of Four, these four minority stakeholders who decide they want to have this new logo. They think it's a way to make some money. Pickett's not going to get involved in that decision. And they're the ones who hire Millbury. They're the ones who make most of the decisions in this period that are frowned upon now. A lot of what you see in this era is the awkward decision-making process, even the actual selection of the Fisherman logo itself. There's apparently meetings where one of those minority owners, Stephen Walsh, is presenting this Fisherman logo as his favorite. But then he opens it up to the conference table and says, all right, What else do you guys think? What do you think about these other logos? But when your boss, the guy who's deciding whether you're fired or hired, deciding whether you get a promotion or a raise, when he's saying, this is the logo that I like, what do you think? What are you going to say? It's not much of a selection process. (laughs) And I think that was happening throughout. Is decisions being made rashly, decisions being made by people who didn't really have an appreciation for what that original Islanders logo meant to the fans, and then entrusting it to people like Mike Milbury, who actually, it wasn't a bad idea to give the reins of the team to him at the time. And yet, because he has this sort of unfettered ability to do whatever he wants, as ridiculous as it may seem, it just all goes downhill very quickly. He gets the GM reins at one point, too. So as Bill Parcell said when he was with the Patriots, right? If you're, they're going to ask you to make the dinner, they could at least let you shop for some of the groceries. And so that's what they do. Just unfortunately, he's not able. And there's only so much out there. You know, the grocery store doesn't have everything to continue the metaphor. If you need a steak and this is the meat they have in your only supermarket, he was the best coach on the market. You can't go tempt the coach of the team that just won the Stanley Cup away to come play on Long Island. Oh, except the Islanders just did that. <laughs> they got the coach of the Stanley Cup winning Washington Capitals. They just got him. So... Way to go, Lou Lamarillo, the Devils GM. So, see, now this is great synergy for me because I could still still keep the Islanders as, as my uh, second-place team there to root for. But that was the thing where there just wasn't that many pieces that they could afford, and it was always no, 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 and so they had to try something. Right, and I think it's actually a good step. Looking back at the media coverage at that time, when they hire Milbury, that's one of the rare public relations wins that they have in this period because Newsday actually wrote a – headline that said, Isles need Milbury before they make that hiring. And they challenged Don Maloney, who was the general manager of the team, saying, you don't have the guts to hire Mike Milbury because you know that if you falter as GM, he could replace you. Milbury has had an interest in being in the front office. He had been assistant general manager already of the Bruins. So there's a chance that you're hiring your own replacement. And yet Maloney does make that pick. Milbury is someone who has a high profile. So as with much of Islanders history, they make some headlines maybe in June and July, uh, but then that doesn't translate into headlines in April and May and, and June in the playoffs so much. So it's a shame that it went the way that it did and that when they did spend money, which was rare, but they did in this case, they got one of the best paid coaches in hockey, but it was misdirected money. You're enjoying my Between the Periods conversation with Nick Hershon. He's the author of We Want Fish Dicks, the bizarre and infamous rebranding of the New York Islanders. You can visit him online at nickhershon.com and at Nick Hershon on Twitter. Or you can toss him a like at facebook.com slash nhershon. And that last name is spelled H-I-R-S-H-O-N. Howie Rose, the TD play-by-play man for Long Island's team from 1995 to 2016, says of We Want Fish Dicks, quote, There were times during the mid to late 1990s when Barnum and Bailey had nothing on the New York Islanders. From a disastrous rebranding to ownership fiascos, 
they became a bad hockey joke. Thanks to Nick Hershon's narrative, it's far more enjoyable to revisit today than it was to experience it in real time. Nick, Howie Rose nailed something there that I wanted you to have a chance to respond to. It's a blast to read this book now, even for fans who were tearing their hair out and burning the Fisherman logo two decades ago. What does that reaction to We Want Fish Dicks tell us about sports nostalgia in general and the connection that people maintain to their teams? Yeah, and I'm glad that people feel that way because, to be clear, I am an Islanders fan. I love this team. Yes, I'm writing about a disappointing time in their history, but it's like I'm some Rangers spy who's trying to make people remember <laughs> We Want Fish Dicks and all these terrible things that happen. And I think what you say is true. There is a certain nostalgia to the teams of our youth, even if they weren't very good as the 1995 to 1997 Islanders were. Just when you see the image of Niles the mascot on the cover, the wave, the logo, it brings back memories. And we may forget that there were still people growing up in that era going to the games with their dads going on dates at the games, having their favorite players, getting autographs from some of those guys. There's still a lot of positive associations people may have that go beyond whether the team was winning or losing. I hope that some of that comes through here and really getting an in-depth look at what was happening that we don't know about. We didn't get to read at the time what Rob DeFiore's life was like as the man inside the Niles mascot costume. Uh, We didn't know what was going on in the executive offices as they're deciding what the next logo of the New York Islanders should be. So for me as a a fan of the team right now, I think, you know, I'd like to know what is Barry Trotz, the current head coach of the Islanders, telling the players in the locker room. A lot of the players are not going to tell us right now. The season's still ongoing. They're all in hockey still. But when you look back 20, 25 years later, as I'm doing in this book, people are going to be more open. They're going to share a lot of personal stories. And you get a really fully fleshed out picture of what your favorite team was doing maybe when you were growing up. And for Rangers fans, too, I found that it seemed to me they would enjoy it because they could read this book and say, wow, they they really, after all those years of being so deeply and darkly in the shadow of the Islanders and having to bring in a whole new team to wear New York on their chest of the sweater and win the Stanley Cup and then win another and another and another and go to the finals and, and all these things that they did, it's Got to be some schadenfreude for them to have watched this and now to be able to relive it and to have hope for their own future because they're in a a rebuilding year. So that's really something that you pick up in We Want Fish Dicks where as I'm reading it and I read it with a critical eye because I know I'm going to speak to the author, you can enjoy it whoever you are. And I often give books as gifts. I'll often give a book if I interview the author. Authors have been kind enough to sign books for me. For you, as I'm reading We Want Fish Sticks, I'm thinking, well, I, gosh, I got to get one of these for, for Christmas. I got to get I got to get one for each of my brothers. I got to get one for a couple other people I know. I'm like, this guy's a hockey fan. He'll love it. Well, this guy's a Rangers fan. He'll love all these parts about Niles going through all this <laughs> suffering, you know? And so the next thing I know, I'm saying, saying, Nick, where where can I get some books bulk and ask you to sign them? And that's something that, (laughs) granted, I'm a fan of the game. I was a fan of the team growing up. But it's not just that. I'm not the biggest baseball fan in the world, but I did love Ty Cobb and Terrible Beauty. I loved learning about that human story of something that a lot of people just think happens. It's just a game. Who cares? It's not, oh, it's not a big deal. Why do you do that? A bunch of grown men getting overpaid. In this era, they're certainly not overpaid when you think about it compared to today. That's something that Gretzky also changes when he comes to the LA Kings. And even then, I think he's the first player to make $100,000 a season. So compare that to today's salaries and anything. And so it is a story where I think Anybody can pick it up. You know, I'll try it out on my mom, who is uh, 82 now, and say, Mom, check out this book. And I bet she would find some things that are fun in there. That they're totally different from us. And that's the idea of a great book, I think. And this is a great book. I obviously read a ton of books, and I love this one. And if people think I gush too much about it, I, I always say, why would I have somebody on as a guest if I didn't think the book was great? So that's what I do when I get a chance to talk to the author. They should hear that after all these years toiling and suffering. But there are some things that I wanted to bring up that we all, I think, thought at the time. And one of them is 
Billy Joel. You would think here's a favorite son. Why isn't he involved with the teams? You hear Down Easter Alexa, the album Stormfront had come out just a few years before that, and Real Connection, talking about the Bayman, and that they play a role here, and we want fish sticks, and in designing this logo. And here's a tough, salty guy. These are guys, are, their livelihood is going going the way of the past. They're being limited in how many fish they can take out and things. And so the Islanders think this is a natural fit. They partner with Billy Joel. They're able to do bobblehead night finally. But unfortunately, that bobblehead night is happening on December 15th of 2018. And when I saw that story, I said, gosh, I, I have to text Nick Hirschhorn right away and tell him. I said, finally, talk about another example here of just terrible timing. He doesn't play any role at all. They invite him to. He doesn't He doesn't tell them to go jump off a cliff. He doesn't. Re- but he does reject him. He doesn't want to be involved. That's another one of those little moments there. And it, it's great for you. And we want fish sticks today. Now, finally, after, you know, 25 years years after it could have helped save the team the great legend billy joel is going to be a little involved and it's kind of cool i thought a little synergy there yeah so when the islanders are thinking about rebranding in 1994 and 1995 they're struggling with this question of what is a long islander what is a good icon we can use for our mascot for our logo and one of the things that they come up with is billy joel the singer is an icon of long island he not only is from long island but he famously sings about Long Island, and he plays so many concerts at Nassau Coliseum, the Islanders Arena. So they pick up on the song you mentioned, Down Easter Alexa, which comes out in 1989 on Stormfront album, where Billy Joel is singing about the struggles of these East End Baymen and how their way of life is going away. They just can't compete anymore. There's new state laws that are restricting how much fish they can catch and so forth. So... The Islanders think at the same time we can use an icon of Long Island, a fisherman, which certainly shows the difference between the Long Island seafaring culture and, let's say, Manhattan with the Rangers or New Jersey with the Devils. But we can also maybe get Billy Joel as a celebrity who could come to some games and maybe he can pitch this to the fan base just the way that I was earlier saying the ambassadors like the former players in the dynasty era could. Unfortunately, The Islanders invite Billy Joel to be part of this process, and he, as you said, doesn't necessarily say, I hate this idea. He just declines, as he declined to talk to me for my book about this process. And then the Islanders unveil the jersey, and at the press conference in June of 1995 to unveil it, they actually invite the Baymen from the East Hampton Baymen Association on Long Island, the same guys who appeared in Billy Joel's music video for Down Easter Alexa. And advantage from Billy Joel played many benefit concerts for those Baymen to help improve their way of life. It's just another one of the unlucky, maybe, parts of this rebrand. If Billy Joel does come on board and he shows up to a few games, there's photos of him in the luxury box where he wears the jersey, God forbid, at a few if concerts. He had luxury boxes. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Coliseum. True, true. <laughs> but yeah, if he had come on board, then... Maybe we're talking about this rebrand a little bit differently and more like the way Jack Nicholson goes to Lakers games or Spike Lee goes to Knicks games and it brings them just a little bit added fame. And yes, when the Islanders announce that they're going to have Billy Joel night now at Nassau Coliseum in December, it's kind of funny to think, oh, after all these years, maybe they finally got some there. Although I'm still not quite sure if Billy Joel's going to show up. I know they're yeah, giving away a Billy. The yeah, they're giving away a Billy Joel bobblehead. I actually just bought my tickets to that game the other okay. day. Still, that would have been enough at the time. Yeah, you know, yeah. To have it. He was yeah. huge at, at the peak of his powers there at the time. I mean, he's still famous today, but then he was still putting out albums, and that would have just been great for them, and it would have been so cool. But yeah, these things don't always come together, and you have to respect it for him as an artist. Yeah. So it's that's just one part of this rebrand that, again, these small things that go wrong. It was a good idea. Pick up on the one of the few icons that Long Island has. It didn't work out. We also texted back and forth about the new Philadelphia Flyers mascot. And this was a cool moment to watch unfold with you. And again, this is something I'm fortunate to be able to do with some authors is nag them about their <laughs> about their area of interest. And Nick is smiling. You can't hear it on the radio, but that wasn't a weird moment. <laughs> taking, no. a, taking a drink of water. It should have Gatorade. We'd have to have someone here to spray the Gatorade on you. And but, <laughs> by the way, you ever notice how thirsty giving up a goal makes a goaltender? <laughs> yeah, that's always true. always need the Gatorade <laughs> right away. I'm so parched from giving up that breakaway. But... Anyway, this is the thing with Gritty. 
he begins, he's universally panned. People cannot stand him. And then they manage to turn it around. And, and you said at the time, if the Flyers start winning, nobody's going to care. And in a city like Philadelphia, which similar to Long Island in the sense that, not that it's a small market, but it feels like it's got a chip on its shoulder. It feels like it's in the shadow because it is of New York and it's got DC not far away. And they feel like they're Sometimes uh, Baltimore is just trying to overtake them, and they, they win a Super Bowl. They win a World Series before Philadelphia does. Or, and so that makes them a little frustrated sometimes. And yet Gritty, despite being, well, I would say more, really, more hideous than Jiggs McDonald here, the uh, who <laughs> many fans at the time said inspired the uh, color commentary man for the Islanders way back when, that this is what he looked like with that red beard. And that looks kind of like my father-in-law did in his early days. He, <laughs> but you can look at that unfold, I think, in a whole new light here. And the science of mascots, these are little parts of the game. And I would also note that the Yankees don't have a mascot. That's one of the ways for the Mets it worked. They were able to have Mr. Met and Mrs. Met. I'm looking at a little magnet there of Mr. Met right in your yep. file cabinet. <laughs> Very old school file cabinet, by the way. I haven't <laughs> seen one of those in some time. But uh, sports fans, so hard to please. And yet, in the end, despite all their complaints, all the fans complaining, the burning of the jerseys, the, the physical assaults on poor, poor Mr. DeFiore inside the Niles costume. Hey, we got your team to stay. You could say whatever the heck you wanted about us, but bottom line is, guess what, Islanders fans? Same with the, with the Devils when they were whispers about them going to Nashville after they won the Stanley Cup. You're going to be with my brother Jim and I, and so is my brother Nick, rooting for the New York Rangers if we're not able to keep smaller teams that aren't marquee Broadway names here in town. So it really ultimately is a positive story, despite all that misery there, because you could still go to Islanders games, and they're going to get a new arena now, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, and when you were talking about the science of mascots and Gritty, the new Philadelphia Flyers mascot, when he was unveiled, I thought it was kind of funny, people talking about how he's such a hideous mascot and what is he exactly? You can't tell what species he's like supposed, supposed to be. To. Look at successful mascots. They don't usually make sense, right? I mean, Mr. Met, as I like to say, is a mutant baseball that has grown <laughs> legs and arms and now has started a family with Mrs. Met and Baby Met. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. The Philly Fanatic, who is one yeah. of the most beloved mascots, most, the most iconic mascots in all of sports, what is he? There's not a clear-cut yeah, no. thing that he represents a certain he animal really or something. Mouth. I don't know what he is. Yeah. yeah the, the tongue goes in and out. And I, <laughs> I was reading the book. I was like, wait a minute. Does that really? I never realized he could do that. But yeah, by, by any rights, any of these mascots, with, with the exception of the man who started all, Ted Giannoulis, shout out for my fellow Greek American, the San Diego chicken, now now known as the famous chicken. He's He's gone beyond one team. Okay, you know what a chicken is, but the rest of these mascots, if you caught them in a dark alley in Philly or anywhere else, you'd probably run the other way or light them on fire. Well, yeah. One of the fun parts of the book is I interviewed Pat Calabria, who was the Islanders' vice president of communication at the time that they made this new fisherman logo. And he talks about the unveiling of Niles as the mascot and fans complaining to him saying, what exactly is Niles supposed to be? We can't really tell who he is besides this bearded guy in a hockey jersey. And Pat Calabria tells the fans, well, you know, he's just kind of like a beach bum kind of a character or like something like that. And some of the fans say, oh, a beach bum. That's a real good role yeah. model for our children to have a beach bum as the mascot. Don't ad lib. And... Uh, <laughs> And then Pat Calabria, though, telling me, you know, decades later, as we're talking about it, like, you know, I used to tell the fans, really? What's the name of the New Jersey Devils mascot? Yeah. Um, I mean, you have a devil as a mascot in the same market, and you're complaining about a beach bum or some fisherman. So when you get to that level of critiquing the mascot like that, it's clear that you just have a vendetta against this rebrand. You don't want it to work. And so you're looking for any little thing you can to criticize a team. Another story that Calabria told me that I thought was really interesting is the trainer for the team at one point comes up to him and says, you know, I did an experiment and I put the original Islanders jersey with the traditional logo and the new Islanders jersey with the fisherman logo into buckets of water. And I saw that the fisherman logo weighs more and it's weighing down the players on the ice as part of an argument of why they should go back to the traditional logo. And one of the great quotes uh, that Calabria says in the book is like, really? How much could a patch on a jersey possibly weigh? Like one hundredth of an ounce? Really? That's what's the players are on an eight game losing streak and they can't get on a breakaway or they can't get back on defense because of a patch. Really? Really? You know, you do feel for these guys who were intelligent guys 
who, you know, were kind of stuck in a difficult situation trying to keep this team on Long Island. And then people are just using every opportunity they can, every excuse to say this logo is bad or this mascot is silly. Mascots are supposed to be silly. You know, as long as they make you laugh at the game, it's a memorable experience to take a photo with the kids. That's what they do. And usually they do that stuff and they're not being beaten up in the stands the way <laughs> Niles was. Or cowering in the locker room. Before. <laughs> exactly. Staying in the locker room for the third period because he's yeah. afraid to come out and have more fan hate. And he is pretty human as far as mascots go. Yosemite Sam with a haircut, that's not bad. If they had been winning, he would have just been another thing that fans probably would have said, okay, I'm watching the game, keep him out of my way, which they usually do. They have the New Jersey Devil for that as far as what might be scary. Sure, make them all smile, but sometimes a smile is terrifying. (laughs) By the way, based on a mythical creature, the legend of the New Jersey Devil, and you mentioned that, and I, I mentioned my mom and my brothers, and when I wanted to root for the Devils and I outgrew my Islanders jersey, let's say, my mother would say, why do they have to call the team that? And we had a young priest at the Greek Orthodox Church that we went to that I had Boy Scouts and everything, and he had played hockey. So he was a big hockey fan, which is very cool. He'd been on a team called the Flying Fathers. They used to play for charity. I used to joke with him, lots of cross-checking, huh? Do you get, get it? Because he was a priest. And, <laughs> so, uh, and he said, no, he says, you know, in Greek, you can have, well, I'm going to do the voice now, but yeah. So anyway, he went there from Greece, had the accent. He said, you know, in Greek, the word, you know, you can say you're a little demon. It's like you say to a kid, you know, you're a little devil. It's, it's okay. And I said, father, can you come tell my mother that? <laughs> because I hear about the team all the time. <laughs> like, right. Oh, why are you wearing that? Not to mention red is the, the Turks color. I certainly couldn't wear that around my grandmother who survived the genocide. All these things may seem silly to people listening, but this is how invested you are. And I think when you start picking on those little things, you were discussing that about them saying the logo weighs too much. If she floats, she's a witch. If she sinks, she's not. And that's the story we want fish sticks is really the story of a love story. And when you start falling out of love with somebody, when you feel your your spouse or your partner is letting you down and is rejecting you and doing things you don't like, man, everything that they do annoys you. They, they can't do anything right. And so in that way, they do succeed in the end. It's great to see them bounce back because that's the thing. It is amazing that they manage despite all of these troubles that they have, all the bad decisions, that they were able to keep those fans, and people still root for them. You still see fans, you see them on the New York City subway boldly wearing them when they know that they're going to be surrounded by Rangers fans, and I think that's pretty cool. That's why I love We Want Fish Sticks. It has a very happy ending in the book, and you put something together here where literally every page, I mean, I open it, I see the name Captain Pat Flatley, Man, I go back to those days, but also that's a guy that you want to meet and talk about. You have stories about him. I would talk to people about that. I said that yesterday I was talking about this book at a dinner. That's a lot of fun, and I'm so glad that you shared it with me. I want to give you a last chance here. I want to pull a goalie. I'm going to let you shoot right at a wide open net with this final question. Why should readers, whether they are hockey fans, whether they're Islanders fans, they root for the San Jose Sharks, Or if they've never picked up a book about hockey, they're fans of some other sport or no fan at all, tell them why you think they should pick up We Want Fish Sticks. Maybe give it to somebody that they love for this holiday season. This is a story, obviously, that I wrote with Islanders fans and hockey fans in mind. But any good story, whether it's taking place in sports or outside of it, is predicated on human interest. The lives of the people involved in this rebrand whether it's Rob DeFiore as the mascot, as we're talking about, the guys in the executive offices deciding how to change this logo and change the identity of this team, and then the players who we haven't talked about too much today, and the fact that they're putting their bodies on the line for Long Island for each other in this era. There's just a lot here about people trying to do the right thing and a lot of things going wrong. So it becomes a colorful story. It's humorous. There's lots of different stories in there that I hope that people will appreciate just, you know, hearing that story about the jersey weighing uh, an ounce more than the other one or hearing about the abuse that Niles faced and everything else, the crazy tactics that Millbury used in games. You can have an appreciation for that even if you don't know icing or offsides. You don't need to have some sort of intuitive knowledge about New York Islanders hockey just to know This is a fun story about a professional sports franchise that was going wayward, kind of got pulled back in, thankfully, and now they're on the right path in 2018 as we do this interview. But I just think there's a a lot there for people to 
enjoy about what was happening to that team and how at least now they're they're on Long Island, they're on solid footing again today. Well, I will give myself two minutes in the penalty box because you're right. I should have at least mentioned some of those players. We talked about the dynasty players, but it does illustrate some of what people wanted at the time. They thought about all those old players that we mentioned, and you were nice enough to mention Ziggy Paul for you. Certainly should have been a star on any team that he was on. And those are the kind of stories that are in this book. There's really so many of them. You didn't, as I said, slather any tartar sauce in the narrative to cover anything up. So I love that. Nick Hershon, thank you for welcoming me here to William Patterson University. And as you were speaking there, I wasn't ignoring you looking around, but is it me or what are the colors here at William Patterson University? Uh, the colors of William Patterson are black and orange. It's yeah. Halloween every day here at William <laughs> Patterson. Chewy. But but very similar to the colors of the New York Islanders, if you squint. It's sort of a, from this Black angle, can look with, a little yeah. bit like a blue shirt. Yeah, the, the orange logo there. That <laughs> sort of uh, goes with your Mets things and your Islanders things. So the book is exactly like that. I've been, I've been sitting in, in Nick's office here all this time and, hey, I just noticed something new. That's what this book is like. Really, if you can get a copy of it, maybe you're not sure you want to buy it pick it up flip through it i bet you'll find yourself reading a couple of paragraphs of it and then a couple of pages and then the bookstore owner will say hey you got to buy that or leave (laughs) you'll have to buy it it's the kind of book that i wish i'd written myself it's really enjoyable whether you are a fan of hockey whether you're a fan of sports or some other team if you're a marketer if you're interested in marketing we won't see this happen again in this era of modern corporate owned franchises where they were free to make mistakes fail greatly or succeed greatly. The Islanders managed to do both somehow and remain on Long Island, remain Long Island's team. I hope that folks will consider the book. We're heading into hockey weather. Hockey is a great sport. If you haven't experienced it, it's a very family atmosphere. You brought that across here, Nick, in We Want Fish Sticks. You welcomed me into your office like I was family, and I really do appreciate that. Love talking with you today. I hope that the hockey gods smile upon you as this book hits shelves and that Santa decides he'll pick it up. I know his colors, I guess, are more in line with the devil's colors, but, you know, <laughs> you've been very nice, not naughty. You're not a gritty or dirty goonie player. <laughs> so definitely hope Santa is going to be dropping these down fireplaces and ones that aren't lit unlike those fishermen jerseys where a lot of people were throwing them to the flames a lot of fun today thank you so much for joining me thank you so much dean it's a topic that i still love to talk about even after all these years of doing the research the writing trying to get a publisher for the book and now doing the promotion for the book and i hope that that at least tells your audience something about i'm not tired of it even after doing all of this work on it i'm sure that you'll enjoy i hope you'll enjoy the work that i put into this and i'd love to hear people's reactions to it Lots of player interviews and people can reach you on Twitter and also check out your website, do all that and interact. And I think this is a book we're going to be hearing about a lot if you're in the hockey community. And if you want to seek out Nick, you'll hear it there too. A lot of fun. He's such an open guy, active on social media. It's great to see an author with a great book who's also great at promoting it. In fact, you're you're even better than the Islanders were back then. I know it's not a very <laughs> high bar, but, but you, have, you have crossed that. You've raised your... Raise a shot just below that crossbar of limits. Yeah, I've made so many fisherman era gifts that I'm going to be tweeting out <laughs> over the next few weeks um, when I'm promoting book signings or just the you know the book itself. Um, yeah, again, I love this topic. I think it's really fun. As you said earlier, there are so many topics of books that get very serious and sometimes even depressing. I just love that I can come back to this and. It still makes me smile. Just looking at that jersey brings back all these kind of colorful memories. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. Again, the book is We Want Fish Sticks, the bizarre and infamous rebranding of the New York Islanders. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com. That banner at the top of the page takes you through to Amazon and amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra taps of your stick or your finger. You can help us keep the flux capacitor on our Zamboni time machine humming like usual. By the way, Nick mentioned that we didn't tell many stories about the players who wore the Fisherman logo on their sweaters. He tells a lot of those stories in the book, and one of them is about Jason Herter, 
He played a single game for the New York Islanders, and so that crest meant a lot to him. It's an honor to wear any sweater in the NHL, and I think sometimes maybe fans forgot that during this period, where it was easy to mock them because of their seeming ineptitude. Well, that's the sound of the final horn. The players are leaving the ice, and the fans are heading for the exits. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until the next time we hit the ice for a trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And on behalf of Nick Hershon, let's go Islanders. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east sign, west sign, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular.